create proto bees, as we call them, which are communities on the ground, anywhere from 30 people to maybe 3,000. And that these can then use network technologies to interact with each other wherever they may be. And so you have uh, the best of both worlds. You have a wonderful life in a beautiful, intact community, and yet you're in touch with the real world economy and other proto bees. Hi, this is Jack Liebig, baseball player and second grader from St. Louis, Missouri, and you are listening to the Vance Crow Podcast. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm glad you're here. Today we are meeting with a character, a guy that has lived a wild life, a man named Jim Rutt, who started out as a working class kid that got to MIT, and then he'll tell you that he went and lived behind dumpsters and worked at Circle K and became a college textbook salesman, and then eventually rose to the ranks of some of the most important internet companies in the world. He has since retired several times and now has so many thoughts on trying to create a system that's different than the one that we're in that allows people to leverage the benefits of the internet, the networks and the way you can meet people from all over the world and share information with this strong desire that we have to live in communities. Jim is a beam of energy and I find myself being so excited to talk with him that I really had to restrain myself to not interrupt and keep guiding him around into different areas because this is one of the profound minds of our lifetime. So I am really excited for you to listen to this. Before we get to that, I want to talk with you about a couple of things that I'm working on. Just the other night in the Articulate Ventures Network, we had two of our members, uh, the Ring Brothers, give a talk on how does one slaughter a steer. I, for all of my years of being in agriculture, from traveling around the world, from being in farming, I had never actually seen what is it like to slaughter a steer, all the way from when you kill it, to skinning it, to breaking it apart. And this is the type of stuff that we do inside of the Articulate Ventures Network. It's access to people that have an amateur love of something that they want to share with you. And so if you're interested interested in meeting a brilliant group of people that are all talking and teaching and sharing with one another, I recommend you check out the Articulate Ventures Network by going to network.articulate.ventures. Another thing we've been doing a bunch of is virtual reality. If you're interested in this, we've been doing, we did our book club in virtual reality. We've started hosting some meetings. We're even doing some talks coming up in the next few weeks. If your corporation is starting to think about how would we dip our toe into it, I have put on some workshops and definitely done some field trips that I would love to share with you. So if you're interested and your company wants to just kind of dip your toe in for a very low cost, just to see what it's all about, let me know by visiting articulate.ventures slash VR. And finally, I want to mention the private interviews. This was something that I decided to do around Christmas time. I had extra time because so many talks were kind of winding up at the end of the year. And it is a way for you to have me interview somebody that you love and respect, somebody that you want to capture their stories, their history, their values, those little quirky things that you can never just put down in writing. And for some reason, when you pull out your camera to record them, they clam up and you can't get them to talk about it. If you'd like me to do an interview with your grandparent or parent or friend that you want to capture their stories, you can find out more about doing this by going to store.articulate.ventures. And uh, for a small fee, I will spend an hour talking with your loved one, capturing these stories and giving you a gift that is priceless to be able to capture their essence, their stories and uh, their values uh, on video. So I hope you check that out. We're really excited about all the things going on. And definitely as you leave this interview, you are going to feel the excitement and enthusiasm that comes from talking with a man like Jim. So without further ado, let's head to the interview. Jim Rutt, welcome to the podcast. Hey Vance, glad to be here. So you're an interesting character because you came across my radar, not because you were involved with one of my favorite organizations in the world, the Santa Fe Institute, but instead because you wrote an article that was so edgy that you got booted off of Facebook. And so uh, that actually, I'm like a moth to flame for this, and I want to know all about this. So tell the listeners uh, what it is that you wrote and why did Facebook uh, kick you off of their platform for it? Well, as it turned out, I don't think it was anything I wrote. Uh, it was uh, probably, this is our best thinking, uh, a 
miscalculation by the AIs that they've let, let loose looking for bad guys, you know, in their mind, QAnons or what have you. Uh, it turned out that uh, this algorithm, which we believe the parameters were changed sometime on Friday, about 10 days ago, uh, booted all three of the admins for a very interesting Facebook group that I am uh, one of the admins for called the Game B Group. And that is a community of about 3,000 people who are exploring the operating system of the future for humanity in a very calm, theoretical way. Uh, we don't allow any discussion of contemporary, uh, you know, team blue, team red politics. We don't talk about current events. And we have a seven person moderator team uh, that keeps things from uh, getting ugly. So it's like, what? Uh, anyway, they uh, blasted all three of us simultaneously. At first, I thought it might have been something I posted, but uh, uh, it turned out it was uh, probably uh, an algorithm that had been tuned on QAnon and somehow found our form of thinking and exploration and the fact that we have our own vocabulary uh, and that we're always trying to uh, take our theory and, and compare it with data and practice in some superficial way, probably has some statistical similarities, oddly enough, to uh, the cue ball, the, you know, the screwball QAnon stuff. Uh, and so they whacked us. And of course, typical Facebook Kafka-esque governance didn't tell us why. Uh, and even better, we got, there's a three different levels of ban. We got the highest, the death penalty. Uh, when you go to the appeal process, it says, this may not be, uh, uh, cannot be appealed and may not be, re and cannot be reversed, right? So this is the ultimate wacko, right? And uh, so we went over to Twitter and uh, started posting. And, you know, fortunately, our community on Facebook is about 3,000. Our community on Twitter is probably about 10,000. Uh, plus, we've got lots of friends, some of them fairly influential. And a fairly large shitstorm emerged. Literally millions of people heard about this. Uh, and, of course, it also turned out we have a pretty well-connected network of folks uh, who are friends and at least four uh, intervene on our behalf with uh, employees at Facebook of, you know, medium level. And uh, lo and behold, less than 10 hours later, the ban was reversed. Uh, but that these son of a guns bothered to tell us, of course not, not in their Kafka-esque fashion. Uh, we were actually on a conference call, the, the whole moderation team, seven people, uh, and, uh, one of them happened to get on a, uh, get an email from a friend. Hey, it looks like you're back on Facebook. So we all quickly hit our computer. Sure enough, we were. Uh, and so that is the screwy story of the, uh, banning of the game B three and their reinstatement with no apology, no notification, nothing. Well, Sue, you bring up like such many, many interesting points, not least of which are this world that you live in, that you're building uh, barns on rented land when you're building a, a group on Facebook. And you could build it all up. You could be doing everything right. And somebody else somewhere far away, maybe not even a person, can flip a switch and have it all shut down. So now that you've gone through this Kafka-esque experience... What do, what do you do going forward to make sure that you're, you know, don't don't continue to build barns on rented land? God damn right. Uh, actually, uh, fortunately, I had smelled that this could happen. So uh, I've been looking for a year for a potential private home, basically a white label platform that had the functionality we wanted and was easy enough for normal people to use. Right. Because we have a lot of people who are not technoids, that are people that are interested in a new way of living. A lot of people uh, interested in living in a regenerative fashion. Uh, they're interested in, uh, you know, real community, et cetera. So tech isn't necessarily their thing. So we didn't want a difficult, you know, pinheaded kind of platform. And, and I've been doing this for 40 years. I was literally worked for the world's first online commercial service called The Source back in 1980. So I have a pretty good idea of uh, what you actually need to build a mass audience. And uh, so I finally found one. And in early December, uh, I set up a, a potential Bolt home for Game B. Uh, just set it up basically, tested it out, put some branding on it, colors, logos, you know, did a couple test uh, subgroups uh, and convinced myself that it looked pretty good. So 
Uh, we got banned on Friday, let back on Friday night. By Sunday, I actually had cleaned up the the uh, new home and we had brought in 40 testers uh, from the community who were uh, started working you know on it make sure it works is this simple enough can we understand it etc what do we need to uh, what decisions do we need to make etc on the tunings the options and uh, we've been going through that process now for about uh, a little over a week and nine days uh, to, tonight we are opening the new game B home for a soft launch to our uh, Facebook community uh, and I expect we will very quickly have hundreds and soon thousands. And then if it all holds together, which I think it will, in a week, we're going to announce it to the world. So uh, we immediately decided this was one step too far from these people. We knew it all along. I mean, as I said, I've been doing this for 40 years. Uh, and, you know, I love your analogy as a farmer myself. You know, uh, you don't want to build a barn on rented land, right? You might, you know, plant some hay or a little Sudeck, something like that. Maybe some uh, soybeans. But I'll be damned if I'm going to build a barn on rented land. So here we were building a barn on rented land. Love that analogy. Uh, now we got our own land. And now we'll build a much bigger and better barn. And uh, literally, we'll uh, should be... Uh, I would say substantially migrated off in another three or four weeks. So that, I think know. that this is the direction of the entire world. And I can remember, so I used to travel around the world before COVID hit and give talks to groups. And one of the things that I was always predicting was this thing we called the social media archipelago, which is that eventually when you have uh, uh, too much pressure on, on any one social network group that it have only a certain political bent or only certain ideas can be there, well, people will leave and they'll go get on their own island. And that island will be so distinct and so separate from the other social media platforms, even though they're living on an island that's maybe just across the river from somebody, they won't even know or hear or see anything from them. And I think that we will watch culture splinter out in a, in a whole bunch of different ways, differently than the way that social media has played out so far. I mean, so far, social media has been a centralizing force. And I think we're going to watch an explosion of a decentralizing force going on going forward. And of course, this is a return to the way the uh, online world was, right? Uh, and that the internet was for a long time, because it used to be that uh, uh, one of the most powerful use cases for the online world, and this goes back before the internet, uh, was what we called affinity groups. Uh, one of the examples I like to use, you know, CompuServe was the, the big power in the middle and late 80s, right? Uh, and uh, there were hundreds, maybe thousands of what they called special interest groups. And one of them I happen to know was a group for aficionados of antique restored Packard automobiles, right? Uh, and, <laughs> That's highly specific. Yeah, there was, I don't know, a couple hundred people on there amazingly, because I guess the same kind of nerdy people that like to restore an old Packard uh, were just the same kind of be running a TRS-80 or a Commodore 64 or something on, uh, you know, character mode CompuServe in 1986. And, uh, you know, they were very distinct from the antique Cadillac people and they hated each other, right? Because Cadillac and Packard were the two competing luxury brands back in the 30s and 40s and early 50s. And so these were very distinct, totally culturally different. And once in a while, one from one would try to invade the other and there'd be a big shit storm. It was pretty funny. So, and then I uh, think about it prior to about I don't know, 2004, 2005, uh, a lot of the internet was also that way, you know, specialty websites for all kinds of things. And then the blog phenomena, right? Uh, people had their own voice. And then there was multi-author blogging where, you know, a half dozen of bloggers of a similar point of view would put up the equivalent of an online magazine. And so that was actually, uh, you know, the heart of the internet from, say, 1991, when it first became more or less legal for consumers, up till maybe 2003, 2004, uh, when the earliest um, social media kind of commingled strange new platforms emerged with things like Friendster and then uh, what the hell was the famous one? MySpace. MySpace, yeah. yeah. Uh, that, you know, total blown opportunity. They should have been the winner, but they just made too many mistakes. And then Facebook came in and snuck in and won most of the marbles. But there was a bunch of other ones. Orkut was out there. Of course, Reddit was out there in that time frame. Uh, and so this uh, attempt to interweave everybody into this indistinct ball of yarn is relatively new, only about 15 years old. And so I think it's not 
at all a bad prediction uh, that many people will will find, uh, particularly in this new crazy environment where the platforms have decided they're going to they're going to become censors. Uh, the, why do we need to be censored? And even though we're not bad guys at all, you read the Game B group, you'll see uh, that we were definitely erroneously targeted. Uh, we're not political in any short term sense, very political in the very long term sense. Uh, but uh, you know, why should we put up with that? You know, uh, why should we put up with the vagaries of uh, some algorithm let loose without proper testing? Uh, and who knows when we start getting more radical, which we may well in the future, uh, then we would certainly be uh, at risk of being snuffed. Uh, and in fact, I'm working on an essay called Facebook's War on Thought. And the warning is anyone who's actually thinking about new things should get the hell off Facebook. If all you're doing is using rubber stamps to repeat conventional wisdom, uh, yeah, probably Facebook, Twitter's okay for you. But if you're actually doing fundamental thought, heterodox uh, ideas about how to make the world better, don't do it on those uh, rented uh, plots of land because they're going to get you sooner or later. Yeah, I'm struck by the idea, you know, uh, Jim Rome, that that motivational speaker, if you go back and listen to some of his talks, he always says, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And I don't think people realize how much time they spend with people on social media and that the average of the people that they're spending time with may be just people, you know, copy pasting some idea that had some kernel of something that they could agree with and they felt like gives them social status if they repeat it. And so they're a part of it. And even though you don't mean to, even though you maybe have different ideas than that, seeing it over and over and over again is no different than subjecting yourself to propaganda. You will eventually have that uh, factored into your average way of thinking. Yeah, and it's one of the reasons I uh, take long breaks from social media. I took a, as I do every year, a six month break from 1st of July to the 1st of January uh, from Facebook, Twitter, and The Well, which is uh, one of the world's oldest, probably the oldest online community. I've been a member of it since 1989. It goes back to 1980. Five, And uh, so I took a break from all three as I'd, I'd been doing it for Facebook for about four years and from the well for 15 years. And so I've come to understand that uh, this stuff is programming us. And so I take a six month break to become deprogrammed uh, every year and, and, and go out and do all kinds of interesting things and then come back, see what's happening for six months before I so then go. Bye -bye. This is, this is awesome. So you're a member of the well, that's like having an air dish number. That's like uh that's a uh, hardcore. So why don't we actually, I, not only go... do I, not only am I a member of the well, I'm a part owner of the well. Oh my gosh. So, okay. Let's for people that don't know, let's go back in your history. Who the hell are you, Jim? You you said you were a part of a group called The Source. You are a member of The Well. You're uh, you know, doing this kind of avant-garde, back-to-the-land, plan B idea. Where did you come from and who are you? I was a working class kid. Grew up in the suburbs of uh, Washington, D.C. My dad was a D.C. cop. Uh, and the uh, neighborhood I grew up in, about half the parents were high school dropouts. About the other half had a high school education. Hardly anybody had been to college. Uh, somehow I lucked out and got into a very good college, uh, MIT, went off uh, and, uh, you know, became a bit of a scholar, I suppose, decided I didn't want to go into academia, went back into the, into the business world after a couple of years of hitchhiking around the country and what have you, uh, you know, living behind dumpsters and uh, working at restaurants, washing dishes and what have you. Oh, is that uh, right? Were you on the uh, electric Kool-Aid acid test uh, path of, of merry pranksters and, and yeah, that, sort of that was kind of a strange combination. I was, we might call a redneck hippie, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, I had fairly long hair and I wasn't averse to smoking a doobie or two, but uh, you know, some of the more extreme stuff, nah, it wasn't for me. I, you know, I want to have my, uh, didn't want to have my brain cells melted. Right. And, uh, so yeah, I had my couple of years of just, uh, you know, enjoying the very good life. I mean, the life on the road was fun in, you know, 1975, 1976. Uh, and, uh, and I enjoyed it to the fullest. And, uh, but then I came back to the real world, got involved in, uh, got a real job working for a college textbook publisher, uh, as a salesperson in Kentucky, in Kentucky, East Tennessee, and a corner of West by God, Virginia. And uh, that was a, a wait, very an MIT graduate that becomes a textbook salesman. That doesn't seem like, uh, was that a step down for you in your mind or a step up from the, from the life of living behind a dumpster? 
it's definitely a step up from living behind a dumpster. And even uh, in my later days on the road, I actually had a little efficiency apartment in Ketchum, Idaho. And it was a step up from that too, when I was working as the night shift manager for the local uh, Circle K. Uh, but uh, no, I didn't really give a shit about success or the latter or any of that crap. Didn't give a shit at all. But one of the reasons I took the job of college textbook publishing it was about the easiest job I could imagine. And I had figured out during the interviewing process that once you learn how to do it, you probably only have to work about eight weeks a year and at least work hard eight weeks a year. You had to take care of the paperwork the rest of the time. And that was about right as it worked out. After about two years, I could basically work eight, maybe 12 weeks a year hard and then dick around, do a lot of the rest of it by phone calls and, you know, and ordering books for professors and stuff. And so it gave me time to work on my own projects. So it was perfect. Uh, I was not interested at all in ye old career game. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I, I thought even, uh, you know, a half-assed job like that was uh, giving the world more of its due than I really wanted, right? If I could, uh, uh, you know, uh, found some other way to ma make a decent living uh, that was even more of a fuck-all job, I would have taken that, but I couldn't find any. And I was right. It was perfect. Uh, but, but, always the but, as it turned out, as I'm wandering around seeing all these college professors, 15 of them a day on average during that 12 weeks a year I was working hard, at least after year two, I start seeing these early personal computers, you know, weird ones like North Star Horizons and MITS and MSI. This is before even the TRS-80s and the Apples. And I start talking to these people about this. And I'd been a programmer when I was in college, a way to make money, basically. And I'd taken a couple of programming courses, but I was not really a big computer science person. And part of it was I didn't like that culture of the big machine room, the giant IBM mainframes and all that stuff, which was sort of the... Uh, computer culture of 1972 when I was in college, but the idea of having your own computer, I go, this is kind of interesting. So in 1980, I went and spent 90% of my net worth, uh, which was a big $4,500 and bought a top of the line uh, Apple II. I mean, top of the line, 48K of RAM on two floppy drives. Wow. Uh, and a dot matrix printer. And uh, got back into writing programs, wrote the world's champion Othello program, beaten IBM 370 with it, uh, and uh, started just seeing what's what up, right, basically in the world of uh, computing and quickly realized, ah, this is neat. And uh, applied for some couple of jobs uh, in that area, got some offers, uh, and then stumbled across, as I said earlier, the source, the world's first consumer online service. Literally, it was for like, apples with modems in them, 300 baud modems usually, 30 characters a second, text, 30 uh, character mode only. And yet we had most of what, by 1981, we had most of what the web has today. We had uh, email, we had chat, we had bulletin boards, we had online shopping, stock prices, newswires. Uh, we even had the world's first Catholic confession done via chat under the supervision of the Archbishop of Washington. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, so uh, I was there at the creation of this crazy online world. And then I went off, started some of my own companies where we applied these uh, low cost, high volume uh, platform technologies uh, to high end products like Wall Street and corporate America and built a few companies, sold them, uh, then uh, retired, got helped some people do another company, retired again. The first time I retired, I was 32, which was kind of nice. It lasted two and a half days. Uh, and uh, then built another couple of companies for myself that did pretty well. Uh, and then got sucked back into corporate America with an offer I couldn't refuse uh, for uh, eventually ended up as the CTO of what's now Thompson Reuters. Uh, the, in fact, I was the first CTO, executive committee member. Figured I'd uh, yeah, work till I was 55 and retire. They had a nice fat pension plan and uh, you know fairly decent stock options, whatever. And, uh, but then I got uh, headhunted out of there to my surprise and became uh, the uh, last CEO of Network Solutions back in the days when they ran the whole domain name system. Uh, and uh, right in the time when the domain name system was being privatized from, uh, we basically had a monopoly, a government granted monopoly, very abusive. Uh, and the company sucked. They were the biggest clowns of misery ever met in your life. Uh, you know, couldn't do shit. Uh, at least in the operation. Interestingly, they had good finance and good legal, but 
technology, um, you know. But that's market. the way of any corporation, right? You you eventually hit that sigmoidal growth where you're at the top of that that uh, growth curve, and the only thing you can add on are more attorneys to protect your your. Oh, stuff even or... worse, this is what makes it so pissed me off. It didn't really piss me off. I knew it was a great opportunity. So it was growing like this. You know, we're in the we're in the, the czars of the domain business in 1999, right? And it's straight up generating cash like you can't believe. And these clowns still couldn't execute, couldn't pour piss out of a rubber boot if the instructions were emblazoned on the heel, as my father, <laughs> used, my father used to say. And uh, so I came in, was Mr. Turnaround. It was actually the second turnaround I'd done. And we got the sucker turned around pretty good. And we settled all of our outstanding issues with the government, retained parts of our monopoly, and the most lucrative parts, uh, entered in the competition in the competitive parts of the world. We're doing real well. And then, uh, value of this pro company kept going up and up and up and up and up and up. Eventually we got started getting offers to sell the company. And I said, shit, so these offers are higher than I'd pay for a damn thing. And uh, my old training at Thomson Reuters where we bought and sold 80 companies a year said, hmm, somebody offers you a lot more than you think it's worth, sell. So we did, we sold uh, Network Solutions in 2020. I stayed on a year as I agreed I would, and then I retired. Well, that is a wild ride, and it opens up um, an infinite number of threads. One that I want to circle back to that we talked about before were the message board, specifically the well uh, that you spoke about before. What is that group, and why why does it hold such esteem out in the world of people that know what it is? Yeah, it was, it was a spinoff from the Whole Earth Review, which was kind of that hippie magazine back in the day, Stuart Brand and his uh, band of... Uh, of, uh, of crazies. <laughs> uh, there it is right there. The last one. That's, is that Kevin Kelly? Is he the editor on that one? Uh, no, I think this was still Stuart Brand was the editor still, on still that Stuart one. Brand. Yeah. Anyway, uh, they somehow came up with this crazy idea in 1985 to start their own uh, online community. And it was, it's basically a whole series that were called forums. Uh, is that what they call them forums? No, they call them conferences. And then conferences have topics and topics live for a long time. They're not like the transient posts on Facebook. A topic might li last for years, might have thousands of posts in it. And, uh, you know, at, at its peak, which would have been about 1991 or 92, it had like 12,000 members. Uh, and a large number of the original movers and shakers of the internet. Uh, in fact, uh, Wired Magazine was cooked up on the well. Uh, Craigslist was cooked up on the well. Uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, was the EFF, was cooked up on the well. Uh, truthfully, I used the piss out of it because by that time I was working at Thompson, uh, Thompson now Thompson Reuters, as sort of Mr. Internet, when nobody knew much about being internet and being on the well, I knew what was happening six months before anybody else did. And as they say, you don't have to be faster than the bear. You just got to be faster than the other hiker. And uh, uh, being on the well provided me that, uh, you know, that uh, uh, heads up on what was coming and what was important, which we I basically took to Thompson. We actually uh, outcompeted our big competitors by quite a bit by just being a little bit faster than they were making the uh, transition to the internet. So, uh, you know, in its heyday, the well was the, the kind of the thought leader of the early internet. Uh, and still to this day, some of them people still hang out there. You know, we kind of joke, it's a little bit like the colonial Williamsburg of the internet. Uh, <laughs> uh, the platform hasn't changed since 1996. About 30% of the users still use the old command line version of the product. There's actually a web version, which is not terrible. Uh, well.com, check it out uh, now, uh, but it's also very contrarian. You must use your real name. You must pay. There are no ads. Your, all your information is totally private. There are no algorithms that are targeting your behavior against you. Uh, you know, it's uh, very interesting. It's uh, the total opposite of Facebook in every possible dimension. And the result is the quality of the conversation is so good, you cannot believe it. Uh, if you're hanging out you know, on the cesspools of Twitter and Facebook and you go to the well and uh, say you join the politics conference, uh, you know, first, you better not say anything stupid because people will tear you apart, but in a nice way. Uh, but, but they'll do it in a very erudite and detailed and factual-based uh, way. None of this living in non-reality. Uh, these are very reality-based people, very smart, very well-read, very good writers. Most of them are better, good, better writers than me. And uh, so, 
I, I really enjoy going back to the well after taking a break. On the other hand, it can be tiring because there's a whole lot. These people seem to have nothing better to do except all day long. Uh, so that's the story of the well. You know, it reached its peak influence in the early 90s, gradually, gradually kind of just, you know, went down. It's now got a hardcore of, uh, you know, the community still there. And they're still having a good time. They still have the highest quality discourse anywhere on the internet, as far as I can tell. Yeah, Stuart Brand had a rather profound impact on on my life on several different in several different domains. Not least of which, when I took the, I used to work for Monsanto, and I actually was the director of millennial engagement. So my job was to uh, talk with people that had come to the conclusion that Monsanto was, you know, pure evil, the the a force for for bad in the world. And uh, so when I took this job, I was like, well, if you're going to try and uh, change the way that people think, you're talking about changing culture. And so I actually flew out to San Francisco and met with Stuart Brand at the the Long Now. And uh, the biggest thing that I learned from that conversation was he said, like, ideas don't change by one person. They change by networks. And if you really want to change the world you have to find ways to to ping together and, and stitch together people that wouldn't meet otherwise because that's the way that you create new ideas. That's the way uh, complexity can emerge beyond uh, what any one individual can put forward. So to, so to be sitting here talking to somebody like you that is out there like actually creating the stitching on the internet uh, that, that uh, brings people together is um, phenomenal. I, I actually didn't fully realize your backstory. Yeah, I did, I did a lot of that stuff. And then the complexity part, of course, after I retired, I decided, well, I don't want to go back to work like I did the last two times I retired, God damn it. So let me find something that'll keep my interests for uh, you know, at least two years, I said. And so I surveyed all my interests and I decided I, an area that I was interested in and knew a little bit about, which was called evolutionary computation, the idea of growing computers via Darwinian evolution. And so I set up a big old lab in my house with a bunch of computers and a T1 internet connection. Holy shit, 1.4 megabits, wow. Oh, I was using those to download music off Napster. I remember T1s. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this was in, uh, in 2001. I think it cost $1,500 a month, but what the hell? I'd sold my company for a pile of money. I could afford it. Uh, and uh, so I started writing evolutionary neural nets that would evolve themselves to play games. and. and came to the attention of the Santa Fe Institute. In fact, someone wrote a New York Times story about my doings. And uh, and so the Santa Fe Institute invited me to go out there. And Santa Fe Institute, as you probably know, is the home of, the, of complexity science. And we hit it, really hit it off. And I, I came out there as a researcher in residence and ended up spending 10 years there. And, and uh, eventually ended up as a chairman of the damn place. And, uh, and so I got quite a deep education in uh, complexity science in, many of its manifestations, you know, the new modern network science of people like Mark Newman and Michelle Gervin, uh, agent-based modeling with people like Rob Axtell and Josh Epstein, uh, econophysics, guys like uh, Doan, Far Doan Farmer, some of the very interesting uh, anthropological thinking in terms of complexity, guys like George Gummerman. Uh, man, it was like amazing. The funny, the funny thing about complexity is, um you have to be so careful when you're writing about it or you're even reading about it that you don't get into the um, magic land, right? Like complexity science is so complicated. So if you were going to describe for people, what, what is the study of complexity? What does that actually mean? It, it, it's the emergence of complexity from simplicity. So the, the best example uh, is, is life. Let's say us. Uh, at the bottom, we're a bunch of atoms jiggling around. Atoms are actually quite simple. You know, every hydrogen atom is identical to every other hydrogen atom. You know, take away the isotopes of deuterium and tritium, but plain old hydrogen, everyone's identical. Every electron is identical to every other electron. So this is actually a very simple domain. But then, you know, these uh, atoms get together and produce molecules, it gets more complicated. And the molecules get together, and produce bigger molecules, organic chemistry, which is hugely complicated, and then that turns into eventually cells, which have metabolisms, which, you know, the graph of the metabolism of the simplest bacteria, uh, I've actually seen this on the wall, a friend of mine's office, you know, cover eight feet of whiteboard in, you know, with the average circle about this big. And, uh, 
Uh, so metabolism is an emergent, it merges from uh, uh, biochemistry. Uh, then, the, then you have a single cell entity. And then magically, we don't know how, but about 500 million years ago, the single cells start operating together as multicellular uh, entities and the so-called Cambrian explosion. And then they started evolving. And uh, from that one event, we believe it was that one single event, uh, essentially all the animal life in the world evolved relatively rapidly. Uh, and, uh, and so basically you have animals which start to be created from uh, cells, which become tissues, which become organs, which become systems. Like think of the circulatory system that uh, Jeffrey West probably talked to you about. Uh, and then, uh, then it, adds up to an organism like us. And an organism lives in an ecosystem, which emerges from the interaction uh, of all uh, the participants, both humans and other animals as well. So uh, that's one of the very best examples of complexity from simplicity. The other one I like to use, it cuts right to the quick, is I like to uh, talk about the relationship between the dancer and the dance. Uh, one can think of the dancers as sort of sort of interchangeable elements, but the dance is the emergent uh, interaction of all the dancers uh, under the influence of the music. Uh, so you can think of a dance as a uh, complex emergent phenomena uh, that is the uh, the dancers in motion under the influence of the field of a piece of music. So. Long answer to a short question. Hope no, that helps. this is this is excellent. I uh, I find the Santa Fe Institute's uh, research and the discoveries that they make to be profound, and and actually to have many many applications to my own life, if not only just the the prism through which I see things. The one that I think is probably the most common example that people here talked about is uh, that you can track how fast people are walking. And, and then backwards calculate, based on how fast they're walking, how dense the city is within 10,000 people. And that, to me, is shocking because it doesn't matter what continent they're on. It doesn't matter what latitude they're at. Really, the speed that people are walking at are, is based on how closely are you packed in there. And you think about that and you say, OK, let's assume this is true. Let's, let's say the research is correct. What other things are going on in the minds of individuals that are impacted just by the virtue of how many other people they're surrounded by? Not even other people that they're talking to, just how many people they're surrounded by. If you remember talking to Jeffrey West, it turns out there's a whole bunch, right? It turns out things like the number of patents per capita, uh, the, no the amount of crime per capita, uh, so good things and bad things, the amount of HIV per capita, uh, all rise at about the same exponent, 1.15, which is very interesting. Uh, while at the same time, the infrastructure uh, it is sublinear. So there's less gas stations per capita, less miles of uh, natural gas lines. Uh, less grocery stores per capita, the more densely people are uh, tied together. So at the infrastructure side, just like in the human body, you get uh, sublinear scaling. You don't need quite, you don't need as much, uh, you know, a mouse doesn't, is much more dense in terms of its infrastructure than an elephant is or a human. Uh, a really big city is uh, actually has less infrastructure per capita than a small town, oddly enough just has a lot more of it. But the outputs are super linear, both the good ones and the bad, how fast you walk, uh, number of patents, the amount of, uh, amount of your earnings per capita, uh, amount of education, almost any metric you can talk about, but then the bad stuff too, crime and disease are also super linear. You get more uh, crime and disease per capita uh, in the bigger cities. I think that uh when I started to first realize what was going on with complexity in the Santa Fe Institute, I think that was one of my first steps back from the, the edge of nihilism, right? Where you think, well, nothing really means anything. Everything's so big. Where do you fit in the billion year you know, system of, of the universe? But then you start seeing something like complexity and you see, at least I have a sense of awe. And I think about you describing that you're building games or neural networks that can learn which almost puts you in the position, I don't want to overstate it, but of as a god, right? You are able to create something that can create something else and spin off. Do you have this same sense of awe? Do you have this feeling of, of power because you can create something that can evolve on its own? Yeah, as it said in that New York Times article back in uh, 2001, when I first saw it actually work, the hair on the back of my neck stood up. Uh, it was like, shit. 
You know, I just wrote some simple rules and told them to go do their thing and they got smarter on their own. Wow. And of course, now people take that to a crazy degree. You know, famously, DeepMinds at Google has created this whole family of uh, learning algorithms uh, called Alpha Zero, uh, which you can, it, it has no knowledge at all of a game. You just tell it the rules and it starts playing it with itself and it becomes a world champion in like two days. Uh, Alpha Zero is now the world champ in uh chess and go and several other games and that's with no uh you know knowledge of the game other than playing itself it's amazing uh and yeah it's really amazing and then and the bigger lens of complexity of course it leads us to believe that that's how everything got here that same way playing with itself in evolutionary competition and it uh, it takes the uh, you know the statement that nothing in biology makes sense except through the lens of evolution. Well, one of the famous, I don't remember who, one of the famous biologists said that. You can now say the history of the universe makes no sense other than through the lens uh, of evolution. And uh, that is a really powerful lens. So the reason that I think you're such an interesting character is that you are talking about these edge, you know, right on the, the, the chaotic edge where you're creating new things, you're in the internet, and yet, the article that we started this whole interview talking about, the Plan B, is almost like a back to the land movement. It's it's definitely a, a reverse of course and saying get back to your community. Where did you come to this? Why why is this the conclusion you're reaching as as you you know age into retirement? Yeah, this is actually a the group work of a bunch of people. This is not uh, my uh, sole invention by any means. You know, the Game B community started in 2013. Uh, it was about 30 people initially. Uh, now it's probably 30,000. Uh, and there's ongoing dialogues. And by, by the way, it's Game B, not Plan B. People oh, sorry, uh, Game make B. that uh, make that uh, mistake a lot. In fact, I believe the article you're talking to is called "A Journey to Game B." It's on Medium. Uh, and uh, it lays out at least my version of Game B, and other people have different versions. Uh, but it is it is interesting that we are all converging to similar takes, uh, which is despite the super linearity of things like income and patents, uh, we've concluded that life in the big city is got more negatives than positives. Because uh, while we may create a few more patents, we're also consuming a lot more of the Earth's resources. Uh, we're living in a way that's not in touch with our basic human nature. Uh, you know, we're separated from uh, the land and the, and, uh, and the water and the plants. Uh, we're not getting our food from our own productions or the productions of our friends and neighbors who we might be trading with. It's coming through this great industrial agricultural model, which has is a miracle. It's figured out how to save eight billion, uh, uh, feed eight billion people, uh, but an awful lot of people are just eating the worst kind of uh, you know industrial food. And we've concluded that we can have the best of both worlds. Actually, in some sense, uh, is that we can. Uh, create proto bees as we call them, which are communities on the ground, anywhere from 30 people to maybe 3000. And that these can then use network technologies to interact with each other wherever they may be. And so you have uh, the best of both worlds. You have a wonderful life in a beautiful intact community, and yet you're in touch with the real world economy and other proto bees. And so you can get at least a goodly piece of that super linear scaling and you can be smarter and uh, and outcompete what we call the game A world, and yet not have to live in New York City or San Francisco or someplace like that. And so uh, I would say we came to this a step at a time. Uh, you know, different people added different pieces of it. One of my key collaborators, a guy named Jordan Hall, another one, uh, Daniel Schmachtenberger, uh, Brett Weinstein uh, has been an important contributor, Nora Bateson. Uh, and many others. Uh, uh, Bonita Roy has had a lot of very interesting ideas that have uh, played into the evolution of this. And we, you know, we didn't know this is where we were headed, but a step at a time, as we've learned more, uh, it just seems like this is the right step for uh, humanity, contrary to what the experts tell us. You know, they tell us the world's going to get more and more and more urbanized. Everybody's going to live in a super city of 25 million people by the year 2100. We don't think so. We think the right answer is step back from that, uh, build our lives at a human scale, but then use the networks for what they're good for, which is to uh, organize uh, capacity to do meaningful work without us all having to be in the same place at the same time. 
I am so enthralled with this idea. And in fact, so I run my own network or I'm with a group of people that are running a network and we've started doing exactly this thing. So just last night, the we had two guys that run uh, their own cattle operation and they did an entire presentation on how to slaughter a cow. After all the years and the amount of beef I've eaten in my entire life, I actually had never seen a cow be skinned before. I'd never seen quarters cut. I didn't know. I mean, I knew kind of where steaks were, but you start to go through that experience and you realize I'll never eat a steak again in the same way because of the experience having seen this done. And I think that um, it does put you in touch with something far deeper about yourself as a human to be around those things. But I myself can't just go get that information from zero. I have to have other people in my network that have that knowledge in order to be able to, to get it and share it. So as you're describing game B, how do you think that people will walk away from game A and walk towards game B? Will it be a lights off, lights on kind of thing? Or will it be a gradual step? It'd be gradual. Uh, in fact, there are you know many people that are trying to make their lives more game B right now. Uh, the big phase transition, complexity term, which we, we think is coming this year, or early next, are the first proto bees, which are on the ground communities where people can at least in considerable part live in a game in a more game B way. But we're not utopian hippies. You know, we've seen that, been there, done that, right? Doesn't really work. Uh, in fact, our farm was a failed hippie commune, at least the, the core piece of it. We bought it from the last communard, as usual, the one with the trust fund, right? And, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, they had, they, had, they had not clue one. And we know how hard farming is. And if you're going to grow your own food, you got to make a real serious commitment to it. And it's frankly not for everybody. And so a, a proto bee may only have five or 10% of the people involved in agriculture, but that's enough. Uh, you, can, you can produce all the food you need with five or 10% of the workforce, as long as you use smart uh, farming techniques and uh, you know people who know what they're doing. Uh, but uh, we would expect people on proto bees to continue to, many of them, to work in the game A world. And we believe we can actually outcompete them. Uh, we call that parasitizing game A, right? Because uh, uh, we think that people who are living in a good place, who are not stressed out by status through uh, stuff, uh, who, whose kids are being well taken care of by built-in daycare and really good high quality education, uh, you know, and just a generally high quality of life, we're actually going to be able to do better work. And because they're living inexpensively, because they're not into status through possessions, uh, they don't need to make as much money as uh, the poor fool living in San Francisco. And so uh, these game B technology companies are going to be able to outcompete the game A technology companies. And gradually, people say, wait a minute, why should I work for some horrendous sweatshop uh, when I can go uh, join uh, a game B venture and then maybe eventually move to a, a proto B and still participate, uh, if I want to, in the work of the world? And so we think it will happen uh, like any good ex any good organism, it'll happen exponentially, but people won't even notice it at first. You know, at first it'll be a few hundred, then a few thousand, a few tens of thousands, then a few hundreds of thousands, then maybe four years later, a few million. So you go through, uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, go through several cycles of this over a period of 30, 40 years, uh, we might reach 500 million people. At that point, the tipping point will occur, we believe, uh, that if we can get 500 million people uh, seriously living the game B lifestyle and out competing game A while they're doing it. It'll be like the old Soviet Union. Uh, game A will just collapse of its own contradictions because people will say, wait a minute, why are we doing this? This is a hell of a lot better way to do it. Just as that's basically what happened to the Soviet Union. You know, the, the, maybe the criticism that I'd like to hear you address is, uh, status, right? Status is deeply important to human beings. I have a close friend named Eric Ward who says, if you have an org chart and no, it doesn't matter how thin you draw the line between two people, as soon as you draw a line, somebody's going to try and figure out who's in charge of the other one. And it's just a natural human reaction. It's what do you not, think about that? You don't? It's okay. not. It is not. Um, if we look back at the foragers, the hunter-gatherers, which constitutes... Uh, 
190,000 of our 200,000 years on earth, they did not organize themselves hierarchically or in status uh, relationships. In fact, they went to great lengths uh, to defeat anyone who tried to play that game on them. In fact, one of the greatest books of anthropology that I know is called Hierarchy in the Forest by Chris Boehm. It actually should have been called Anti-Hierarchy in the Forest, but he called it for whatever reason, Hierarchy in the Forest. And he explains how uh, forager people, despite the fact that our near relatives, the chimpanzees, are very hierarchical, uh, we managed to get out of that box and we would not tolerate hierarchy. And in fact, anyone who tried to uh, pull that game uh, would be first laughed at and then ignored and then exiled. And if they kept coming back, trying to say, I'm the boss, they'd be killed. And uh, the enabling technology was unlike chimps with the biggest, baddest chimp was really pretty hard to deal with. Uh, humans had weapons. And so even a random dude could kill the biggest, baddest dude in the, in the band. And uh, humans built this anti-hierarchical way of life that uh, la uh, lasted for 95% of our time on earth. And we believe, this is a core idea of game B, that we can get back to that. Uh, as an example, you do need leadership, but how did the foragers do it? They, and indigenous, some indigenous peoples today, not all, um, they use what's called role-based leadership rather than position-based leadership. So the guy who was best at you know, hunting buffalo would go out and lead the band that was hunting buffalo, but that was his only uh, authority was to lead people on buffalo hunts. And when they were back in the camp, he wasn't the chief. Nobody gave him any extra respect. Uh, you know, uh, Mary, who was the greatest berry picker, she led people on berry picking expeditions. And oh, by the way, if, uh, you know, if, they, if some new up and comer turned out to be better at it, they took over as the role based leader. And these things, you know, or even you know, the guy who was in charge of the buffalo hunt got tired of leading the buffalo hunt. Besides, he wants to go start napping stones. He could just say, well, I'm not doing that anymore. Uh, so much, much, much more fluid and emergent. And the biggest challenge of game B is to be able to do that as well and better than. Uh, then game A does it. And we believe that we will have a huge competitive advantage. Because what would you rather work in? A world where we're all collaborating together as peers in role-based, rotating role-based leadership, or one of these god-awful command and control structures. Uh, we believe that over time, uh, we will pull the talent out of game A because it will prefer the game B way of organizing work. And so our ability to parasitize game A just gets stronger and stronger over time. We pull out the talent, leave the stiffs there. Uh, they're less effective structures or more effective structures. Looks like we're going to win. That's our that's our theory. Well, there's no doubt like it, the, the modern corporation today, if you go look at their hierarchical structure, it is exactly the same as it was in the 1930s, maybe even the 1890s. Whatever structure they had where there's a guy on top and then they have three people to report to them and, and on up. I... Uh, I personally would love the system that you're talking about, but I have strong doubts about how that happens. So I, I uh, yeah, I mean, it's very interesting to hear you. It's talk time about for us to put, uh, you know, our words to action because, you know, proto bees, which is on the ground communities will happen this year. Uh, the other ones that will happen this year are game B ventures. Uh, we will be starting up some businesses on these principles and maybe we're wrong, but maybe we're right. Uh, and we'll soon find out. Yeah, I think some of the coolest companies that are out there right now, the guy I mentioned before, his name's Eric Ward. He's with a company called Ag Biome, and they uh, don't do raises or or um, they do raises, but they don't do uh, what promotions in the same way. So in their company, if you want to uh, get a get a career milestone, they call it, you actually have to advocate for yourself. You have to say, hey, I think that in two years ago I was doing this work. Now I'm doing this work. I want to find an advocate and four people that I'm going to go ask for their feedback. Do you think I've been moving forward? What is your direct feedback? And then after you get those four people's feedback, you take it to a committee that's made up of the larger organization and they make the case for you. How are you doing? Are you moving up? And they give you really concrete feedback as to whether or not you've achieved it or not. And so they don't have this... Uh, well, I moved up. I'm now. I went from scientist one to now I'm scientist three, and I'm really excited about continuing to get to scientist four. And instead, they're able to collaborate. And what that allows is exactly like you were saying, within their company, they are uh, 
they're allowed to choose which projects they work on, which means they actually have way more fun and way more interest and get up every day a lot more excited about it. I had I would never have crossed my mind unless we were talking that you could do that on a larger scale than just that one company. It, it genuinely wouldn't have crossed my mind. They're not the only company that does that. A company called Valve does that. They're the ones who run the Steam online game system. Uh, Zappos does a variant on that uh, uh, called Holacracy. Uh, it's uh, another example. Uh, and, there are, and there are others. Uh, and it's growing. And uh, as you say, uh, it ought to work better. And it's certainly, and most importantly, in the, in the transition period, it ought to attract the most talented people. Because uh, what would you rather be in that kind of company or, you know, grinding your way up the hierarchy? And I can tell you, even though I rose to the top of the hierarchy, uh, uh, most of the people raised, rose to the top of the hierarchy didn't do through, through, through talent. They did through backstabbing and politics. And, uh, uh, you know, being in a big corporation most of the time is not a very pleasant way to spend eight to 10 hours a day. And, uh, and that, again, just like the Soviet Union collapsed when the people could see on TV what it was like in the West, uh, when people can see what it's like to organize work and production and life uh, without command and control, without hierarchy and without status through possessions, uh, at least heavy emphasis on status through possessions, I think people are going to vote with their feet. You know, the more you're talking about this, I mean, and part of it's just my excitement to see you being so excited about it. But I often will talk with people in the ag world and say, look, you don't understand the people that are going to a corporate job. They're there from, let's say, 830 till five at night. And uh, they're making the appearance that they are working for those eight and a half hours. But in fact, the Internet made it so the amount of work that they have to do in a given week is not 40 hours. It's about four or maybe six. Yeah, maybe probably more 10. like 16 that's a good yeah number. and so then they, they they like when they're done with that work the rest of their time is filled with trying to justify the 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 time that they're spending there the salary so they're participating in meetings where no decisions are being made they're going oh, to yeah. the, the hierarchical and and people hate it and i think that it is a huge reason why you see men losing their minds and the suicide rate of of adult men that are even successful is so high and it's because if you're going every day and doing work that you know is meaningless, it reflects on your own soul. Like it, you, you can't carry that. Absolutely agree. In fact, there's an old saying in GE, which was considered the best managed company in America for very many years, that a uh, a serious GEite spent a third of their time doing their work, a third of their time managing their boss, and a third of their time managing their career. Uh, and uh, that was the best managed company in America. And I'd say that in a lot of those big companies, in, uh, it's like less than a third. That's like, you know, you know, more like maybe you do 25% of your day uh, in actual work, something like that. So yeah, no, and it's demoralizing. And, but, but on the other hand, it's easy to be anesthetized by the cycle of status, debt, uh, and more work, right? Oh, I got a new Lexus. I got a Rolex. Oh, I joined the country club, go play golf, right? And that's how they pay these people off. And uh, but when the spell breaks, when the glitz in the matrix appears and you see there's another way to be in this beautiful proto B where you live in a fairly small but nice house in an on the ground community of like minded people of honesty and good faith, uh, where your kids are taken care of by the community, just like they always were in the old days when I was a kid, you know. Uh, we weren't afraid to go out and go for miles, right? It wasn't this uh, uh, fear because all the parents were more or less watching out for the kids. And uh, that kind of community, people are craving them, but a lot of them don't even know it's possible. But when the word gets out that it's possible and that it actually exists, I expect the defectors from, uh, from the game A world will, will happen on a massive scale. Yeah, the child raising thing is one of the things that I, I really was not aware of until we had a child about six months ago. And all of a sudden you realize part of the challenge of the status game of the of the making money and trying to live at a certain level is that you now have to outsource your child care. So you're finding somebody that's low status, you're paying them money, and you're saying, I'll be back in six to seven hours, and there's nothing to do with the community. You're not asking them to instill values. You're just like, keep your eyes on them to make sure they don't 
choke or fall or you know stab themselves or do whatever and and wait till uh, they're wait till they're 12 and you don't want them you know screwing around or whatever right <laughs> uh but yeah it's like, and, and yet you know i was a kid we didn't have any of that shit right uh, uh we just went and lived in the community lived in the we had the we had the woods we had the you know the baseball fields you know we did you know we just did our thing you know we come home at dinner time that's all you did right from a remarkably young age three or four right and uh that world does not exist uh for an awful lot of people today and they crave it and that's we believe that that kind of community will be built into the proto bees you know some percentage of the people uh, will actually have as their job being community people, making you know making community happen, and they'll be paid by the proto B to be uh, uh, community people to make uh, you know all that traditional stuff happen, and it'll be high status work. We paid the same as a Python programmer, probably or damn near, and uh, we just think that's a better world. Well, I think that my audience, uh, which is largely made up of farmers, are either going to say, I live in Proto B or in Game B right now, or they'll, it, they'll be very interested in finding a way to participate. So if people wanted to learn more about um, Game B and, and uh, getting involved, how would they do that, Jim? The best way, as we call it, is find the others. And for now, the best way to find the others is on the Game B Facebook group. Just go to uh, Facebook in the search box, type in Game B, all one word, and you will find about 22 different groups uh, that are doing different things like Game B parenting, Game B communities, Game B education, Game B governance. But go to the main one that just says Game B and say, I'm here, and uh, we'll take it from there. Well, I hope that when you uh, really launch your next uh, your your barns that you're building on the land that you own, that you let me know, and I'll be sure to share it with everybody else because uh, I I want to see you grow, 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 and get away from the algorithms. Very good, and oh, of course, by the way, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, we'll soon be going off to our new home. So for now, go to Facebook. But if you're on Facebook, the word will be spread immediately where we're going next. And Jim, if people wanted to listen to your podcast or uh, find you in other places, where would they do that? Uh, JimRutshow.com. Uh, that's the uh, home for our podcast. We're also up on 155 different podcast apps. So any app you use to listen to your podcasts, uh, uh, just type in Jim Rutt Show. You'll find me. You can also uh, you know, find my bio at the Santa Fe Institute. Just type Jim Rutt. SFI and it will find my bio and uh, that's probably about oh and, and also uh, my various essays on various topics on medium uh, you know go to medium just type in Jim Rutt you'll pull up eight or ten uh, essays including the, a journey to game B and I, I'm not a real heavy Twitter or twit or whatever the hell they call themselves but I also Jim underscore Rutt on Twitter uh, I say an occasional interesting thing but uh, so you can check me out there too. Well, thanks so much for coming on, Jim. I uh, I cannot wait to see where this all goes. Yeah, it's been a wonderful conversation. I, you obviously have a head, your head into similar ways of thinking. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs>